So they came back, they did good too. It's not just guilty. Well, welcome to Riverside Baptist Church. We're glad you're here with us this morning. We're glad that we can gather together without tornado warnings to worship the Lord. Uh, like we did last week, you know, we had a couple of guests here last week. Everybody's phone was going off between about 10.55 and 11.20 because of the, the situation and the weather patterns and things like that. So uh, we're glad today is uh, much more pleasant weather-wise and glad that we are uh, were brought safely through the storm by the Lord last week. Uh, by way of announcements, a couple of things. Uh, ladies, Circle of Friends meets tonight at 5.30 in the Fellowship Hall. So please, ladies, come out to that meeting tonight at 5.30. Next Sunday morning, Baptist men will meet at 9 o'clock. So fellows meet in the Fellowship Hall at 9 next Sunday morning for breakfast. Uh, a week from Saturday, that is August the 22nd, we're going to have the church picnic. Now, I don't care if you've been here 90-some years and you've come every year to the church picnic. Please sign up. To let us know you're coming to the church picnic so they know how many hamburgers and hot dogs to get. Uh, don't presume upon everybody's memory that you've always been here and of course you're going to be here. Uh, we try not to be presumptuous and so it helps us have a good count if you would sign up. Also invite friends, invite neighbors. It may be a great way for some of those folks who might not know their first time to meet people in church to be in an official church service but Oh, yeah, okay, we'll come and hang around for a picnic and uh, set up the um, cornhole and the other things like that. And we'll have some fun and they can get to know us and we can get to know them. So it may be a great way to invite some folks to church and get to know some of us. All right? But uh, if you do and they say yes, mark that down next to your sign up so we know how many guests. So you go ahead and sign up yourself and then add to it later as the guests say yes, we hope you pray. Circle is sponsoring the churchwide uh, collection of school supplies, so please be on the lookout. Uh, they're probably on sale now because it's that time of year. I think uh, two weeks the kids are going back to school, if I understand the calendar right. So uh, please be on the lookout and be in prayer about what you can provide and supply. Of course, paper, pencils, things like that are helpful, but also uh, classroom cleaning supplies, uh, tissues, wipes, uh, disinfectant wipes, that sort of thing. Always helpful for a teacher to have. Um, this. Uh, Faye needs to know if you have an address change. You know, every year at September, she puts out a new directory, and you can uh, update your notebooks with the new directory. So please, if you have a new phone number, if you got rid of your landline on the cell phone, anything like that, uh, make sure Faye knows so she can update it before we need to get those out. Any other announcements? Okay. Uh, I have the tickets for the uh, fundraiser. Thank you, yes. Uh, we're having the uh, fundraiser. Uh, we're not going to do the pork chumps like we have, Ken. We're getting it catered by Captain Bombs, and we're doing Thursday lunch and supper. So we have a lunch option, a supper option. Of course, they can buy both. There's barbecue chicken and fried chicken in the meal. Uh, I don't know, is that wrong? The it, barbecue it just fried chicken? plain barbecue and fried chicken, not barbecue chicken. Not barbecue chicken. Oh, it's barbecue, like poor pork barbecue yeah. and fried chicken. Okay, I thought it was barbecue chicken fried chicken. Okay. No. All right. Hey, at least it's not a Yankee. Barbecue is not what you do on your grill. I know that much. <laughs> Remember. I'll, uh, I'll be in the fellowship all that service. If anybody wants to come and get some tickets, I have them. Yes. Uh, the most important thing for the fundraiser to be successful is that we sell tickets. Uh, they're $10 a plate or $10 a ticket. Uh, and I understand some of the ladies are going to provide homemade desserts that are sold in addition. Not included. We're going to talk about that at Circle this afternoon. That is yet to be determined. But I, it's not been finalized yet, but I feel like that will happen. Okay. That is yet to be determined, but, but probably. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, but those are not included in the tickets, I understand. Yeah. Those would be separate that sales. That would be a separate thing. 
So we need tickets sold, take them to work, take them to places you frequent, uh, neighbors, friends, anywhere, everywhere you can think of. And uh, everyone knows barbecue, everyone knows fried chicken. So hopefully we'll be able to sell a lot. And that, those funds all go to Circle and the Baptist Men so they can do their local ministries. So it's all going towards uh, the Lord's work here in our community. So meet up with Bert, he's got the tickets, and you can get them from him and show something. I need to let you guys know a change in schedule. I will not be here tomorrow, but I will be here Tuesday instead of Monday for uh, office hours. I just have to be up in Virginia for an appointment Monday morning. So I'll be in the office Tuesday instead of Monday. Anything else? I want to add something just so everyone knows. Okay. When the reason that it's not pork chops, uh, Wayne Cooper and his team have offered, even in the spring, to do it for us. But because we don't have the number of volunteers that it would take to, to carry that out, it takes a lot of people beyond what him and his team cooking. But I didn't want anybody to think that oh, he wouldn't do it. It's our doings that we don't have enough people. Right, even with Wayne and his crew cooking the pork chops, it takes quite a few people uh, beforehand, of course, to sell plates, that's the same, but to be there that day to, to chop potatoes, to cook the green beans, to uh, make, make up the plates, to, uh, I mean, we still need folks to deliver the plates on our fundraiser, uh, so that part's the same as well. We will need some volunteers, but the plates will be made by Captain Bob's uh, because we don't have a, the volunteer base to do it like we have. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Holy Father God, we thank you for this day, Lord, and we do thank you for the, the better weather and that you uh, pulled us safely through the storms last week. We thank you, Lord, that we can gather here in your presence. Uh, we thank you for your promise that where two or three are gathered, you are here. And so we gather in your name to worship your holy name. And we invite you to be here, Lord, in a way that we know we have met with God when we leave this place. Let us be more conformed. Let our minds be more transformed and renewed. Let our hearts be refreshed and encouraged. Let our weariness be washed away with your strength and your determination. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be here in a way that we understand your word better because you have taught it to us. Let us worship you through music and through giving and through reading and responding to your word. And let it transform our lives. I pray, Holy One, that you would use us as we leave this place to be your light in this community around us. And I pray, Holy God, that you would bring our church family who are not able to be with us back safely next week and in the weeks to come. And I pray, Holy God, that you will bring new souls into your kingdom by spreading your gospel and using us to do it. We ask these things so that we may glorify you and that we may grow in maturity and this church will grow in numbers of saved souls who worship you and do your work. Because we know that's your will, we ask it in the name of Jesus that your will will be done. Amen. Hymn of praise this morning is hymn number 184. A stand is saying all the verses of 184.
move into the part of the service where we share our prayer requests and concerns with each other. Uh, before we go into the, uh, the usually medical uh, requests that we have, I would like to say a few words about a great prayer need. And that is we need to pray for our church together. Um, someone sarcastically said this morning, we've got such a great crowd here today. And uh, it's about 30 people. Yeah, I count you guys. So do others. Uh, and we know some of that's traveling. Ken and Deanne are seeing Emily at Wake Forest and taking some of her stuff. We know some folks are enjoying the last bits of summer, going camping and family, things like that happen. But we've been running. I right? can say that honestly, since we sure are repetitive, our numbers haven't been what they were. And I said before, uh, what I've, little I know about revitalizing and bringing growth back to the church is uh, two core things have to happen. One is we've got to pray. We've got to pray together. We've got to pray together for each other and for the lost and for our church. And um, one of the, it's not defining words, one of the more uh, popular and seminal words about church revitalization and what causes churches to go under, which happens every week in America when Southern Baptist Church closes. And one of the first things, the most important things, is that they have stopped praying together. So I want us to pray first before we get to the, the physical list and our normal prayer requests and updates, a special moment of prayer for the church. And I want to invite you to come Wednesday night and pray together again with us for physical needs, spiritual needs, and for our church. And it's in that prayer meeting at 630. But let's pray together for a moment for Riverside and for each other. Holy Father God, we come before you here in this place because we love you. First and foremost, you are our Savior, our King. But Lord, we gather here specifically with these people specifically because we love this church, this local body right here that calls itself Riverside. Lord, I've only been here four years, but I love the people here. There are people who've been here all of their lives and their families have been here. They are tied to this community. And they love this church. And Lord, we all want us to thrive together as your church, your body. And so Holy Spirit, I ask you to be completely, powerfully in charge of us. If there are things we need to stop doing, things we need to start doing, there are ways we can reach out to more people and share the gospel more effectively. If there are ways we're hindering your movement in this community, Lord, please convict us so we can repent and we can submit better to you. If there are things we need to do, Lord, convict us so we have the boldness to go do them. And Lord, Holy God, I pray that you would lift yourself up. Help us lift you up. That you would draw people to you to worship you here. That this fellowship, and this church body would thrive and continue. We pray, Holy God, that you would do this because we obviously don't know how. And Lord, I pray that you would guide and direct us so that we would be your hands and feet. That our focus wouldn't be, I'm afraid we're not going to survive. But our focus would be, I want to serve Jesus, make disciples, and bring folks into the body of Christ. Because that's what you've told us to do. So help us to do it. To do it well and consistently. And we pray that this place would grow in worship, in maturity of faith, and yes, in size of number of worshipers who gather together. We ask this so that your will be done and we will be pleasing to you. I ask this and agree with my brothers and sisters here because you've told us what we agree 
in your name you hear. What is consistent with your will, you will give and do. And so we ask your will to be done. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The second thing, first step is prayer. The second step, always, was for a church to direct its attention, not always internal, but also external. And it sounds counterintuitive. The growing ministry to others helps grow the church. Because people see we're doing things for the community. And they want to become involved in that. And so I'm working with um, one of the directors at Miss Edith's new home, Brookdale. And I've asked the choir to consider uh, them joining me. And you are all welcome in joining. That we are, uh, if it works out and we can arrange it, one Sunday a month, go and provide one of their Sunday services in the afternoon. And maybe you meet some of the family, bless some of the uh, seniors who live there. And there are other things we might be able to do, not starting new ministries, but volunteering at the food bank, volunteering somewhere else that always does, already does work. We don't have to start something new. But be involved in the community, that's the community see that we care for. Them. And that's attractive to people. So if you know of a place you want to get involved in, if you know of a burden on your heart for people you want to help serve, then maybe we can get others here to do that too. Share that with me. I'll share you with you some ways like this at the uh, Brookdale, the retirement home, food bank, and others, places that we can volunteer and help on a regular basis. Now, going to our other prayer request, uh, I would like to say that we've got uh, a praise. Uh, if you know Landon, who's normally in uh, Sarah's Sunday school class, uh, Isaac's friend and the parents of Tyler and Ashley, uh, they had their baby last night. Gabriel Jack Ross was born, weighing about uh, seven pounds and somewhere 12, 13 ounces. I forget the exact ounces. But he's healthy, he's happy. Mom and baby are both doing well. So uh, praise for them. Um, we have grief to share. Uh, Lillian's brother, Faye's stepbrother, uh, brother-in-law, excuse me, uh, passed away earlier in the week. So please remember the Gray family. What other? Oh, and I was given a, uh, an unspoken this morning, a unspoken, unspecified mental health need. Someone that we have. Other prayer requests, updates, praise reports. Talk to share. Tony. We got to give and we come before you. So thankful that we can do this over and over and over. Uh, with all the needs, all the burdens, all the joys of our heart. You care about them. You want to know them. Even though we're so tiny compared to you. You care for each one of us. And not just us, but all of the people. Lord, that boggles our minds. But it blesses our hearts. Because without you, we couldn't make it. There'd be no reason to try to make it. So Lord, we come before you offering praise and thanks that you have brought new life into this world. 
We pray for Tyler, Ashley, Landon, and Jack as their family changes, that they would grow. And we pray that they come to know you as Lord and Savior and grow in a Christian way. But Lord, just as you bring in new life, you also escort people out of this life into their eternal home. And so we pray for James's family, that you would give them peace and your comfort in this time. Holy God, we pray for folks who are most probably facing the end of their life here. Like Elizabeth Page, we pray, Holy God, that you would be with her and touch her, give her strength and courage and grace after this devastating prognosis. We pray, Lord, that she would not actually be devastated. She, we hope she knows you. If not, we hope she comes to know you before her life ends in this world. Well, we, got, we have several unspoken requests, unspecified needs that you know. We are in the depth of each person's heart. We know every atom in their body, every emotion, every thought, every spiritual reality we can't see. So we pray, Lord, that you just take charge and work your perfect work in their life. And I pray that there's a way we can minister to, grieve with, rejoice with these that we've mentioned. Help us to do so in a way that points them to you and brings them closer to your heavenly Father. We ask this in the name of Jesus so that your will will be done. And I pray you help us always to submit to your will. Amen. Now a special song by Jenny and Kent. We've got peace like a river. what makes that song good is the simple, powerful imagery. Notice that the three types of water, the river, 
the ocean, the fountain. They're all moving. I don't have joy like a stagnant steel pond. <laughs> I've got joy like a river. Love like an ocean, peace like a fountain. It gushes up, it moves you along in the current. It's living, moving water. I love that. Thank you. Join me, if you would, in Genesis chapter 26. We've been studying through Genesis for a while now with some uh, interruptions like our revival and other special holidays and things like that. We have finished the story of Abraham. We're about to wrap up Isaac because he doesn't have many of his own narratives. And most of the rest of the book is focused on Jacob and then his sons uh, as the, the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. Or what would become Israel, the nation. But this story is about Isaac. And it is similar in many ways to a story we read and talked about with Abraham. Uh, a famine comes to the land. Isaac needs to move from where he's living to another place because of this famine. And when he gets to that place, it's an area called Gerar, and the Philistines are in charge of it. Their king is named Abimelech. And Isaac stays close to the capital, close to Abimelech. And he, like his father Abraham, has this worry that comes into his mind. His worry is... And most of us would not understand this worry because we would think this is a great thing. But he worries, my wife is too pretty. Now, most of us, we have beautiful wives, beautiful ladies in this church. So again, we don't have that problem. Right? We're like, yeah, my wife is pretty. I'm so glad I gave you a pretty woman. But Isaac's worry is, my wife's really pretty. They might kill me and take her as their wife which is very familiar because Abraham had the same worry about Sarah when he went to Egypt. And then when he went to Gerar and was dealing with the former king, also known as Abimelech. Isaac follows in the family footsteps, unfortunately. He lies about Rebecca. He says, she's my sister, which worked so well for his father. And this lie carries on for a while. He stays there for a while. And then the king of Abimelech looks out from his high tower and sees Isaac and Rebekah. Uh, one translation says caressing. I think the King James calls it sporting. Anyway, they were not behaving brotherly and sisterly. They were probably smooching, making out, picking the euphemism you might want to call it today. They were acting husband and wifely, affectionately towards each other. So he calls them on this lie. He says, why have you lied to us? We could have had great guilt if one of my men had taken her for a wife. And so he issues a decree that no one's going to harm Isaac or Rebecca, that they're husband and wife. And there are some hard feelings, but Abimelech does not retaliate. However, we find out that his people are not so uh, forgiving, or maybe that he's working through them instead of directly. But looking at Gen Genesis 26, Starting with verse 12. I'm reading from the uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible. Isaac sowed seed in that land, the land of Gerar, and in that year he reaped a hundred times what was sown. The Lord blessed him, and the man became rich and kept getting richer until he was very wealthy. He had flocks of sheep, herds of cattle, and many slaves, and the Philistines were envious of him. Philistines stopped up all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of his father Abraham, filling them with dirt. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Leave us, for you are much too powerful for us. Basically, you've become too large. Not physically, Isaac was probably still slim and healthy, but he had too many servants, too many flocks, too many herds. It was too much for the land to take care of and all the Philistines who already lived there. So Isaac left there, camped in the Gerar Valley, and lived there. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the days of his father Abraham, and that the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died. He gave them the same names his father had given them. Then Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of spring water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen and said, This water is ours. So he named the well Essek which means quarrel. 
came to Essek because they argued with him. Then they dug another well and quarreled over that one also. So he named it Sidma, which means hostility. He moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. He named it Rehoboth, which means open spaces. And he said, for now, the Lord has made space for us, and we will be fruitful in the land. From there he went up to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him that night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your offspring because of my servant Abraham. So he built an altar there, called on the name of the Lord, and pitched his tent there. Isaac's servants also dug a well there. Now Abimelech came to him from Gerar, and Ahuzath, his advisor, and Phicol, the commander of his army. Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me? You hated me and sent me away from you. They replied, We have clearly seen how the Lord has been with you. We think there should be an oath between two parties, between us and you. Let us make a covenant with you. You will not harm us, just as we have not harmed you, but have done only what was good to you. Sending you away in peace, you are now blessed by the Lord. So he prepared a feast, I'm sorry, he prepared a banquet for them, and they ate and drank. They got up early in the morning and swore an oath to each other. Isaac sent them on their way, and they left him in peace. On that same day, Isaac's servants came to tell him about the well they had dug, saying to him, We have found water. He called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is still Bear Sheba today. Bear is well, Sheba is oath, or possibly seven, but oath makes more sense. Isaac and the Philistines had this problem. Isaac is not guiltless. He started it with lying to their king and the people in their capital city. They were not blameless because they kept harassing him, either covering up his father's wells or taking wells of him and his people had just dug. Uh, there were property disputes. There were uh, pushing and striving and opposition towards each other, uh, at least for a while, while Isaac was trying to settle and find wells and water in a place where he can set up a longer term home. It says they were jealous of him. And it said he was afraid of what they may do. And jealousy and fear often start our problems with each other, don't they? And I think this often overlooked story, because it sounds so much like Abraham's story before, it is important for us to look at because it is very often the similar story to what we find ourselves in. It is similar to the story we very often find ourselves in. Let me phrase it that way. Don't you or someone you know, have you ever been in a situation where you constantly have this sort of cycle of hostility with somebody? Maybe it starts with insults and jabs and interpersonal conflict and, ooh, you just don't like them. They, they rub your fur wrong. You know, they get your back up. And anytime they're around, you just, Arr. and maybe you, you snipe at them and they put a jive at you and then it kind of builds and escalates. I know at least a couple of you ladies, and maybe a man that you might not want to admit it, I have. Have you seen Downton Abbey? The old show on PBS, there's kind of this Edwardian British soap opera. But there were three daughters in the family. One of the youngest one was great, and spoilers, she died off real soon, but she was the good one. But the middle daughter and the older daughter always went back and forth, always. And at first it's insults, and it's just putting each other down, but they start really to sabotage each other's life. And it just keeps escalating and escalating until they really are hurting each other, sabotaging one another's chances at, at success, at finding you know, a man to love, and all that stuff. Like I said, this is a soap opera. Sorry if you thought it was really high class. It's a British soap opera. But 
it resonates with us because we know people like that, don't we? Or we sometimes are people like that. Aren't we? Where that other person just gets you and you've got to get one back. And maybe sometimes it comes to you in the middle of the night. Oh, I should have said this. Or next time I see so-and-so, I want to put him in his place. And every time you think about him, your head is just bob and you've got to get your sass on. And we retaliate in kind. Well, maybe we even escalate and take it to the next level. That could have happened here. Isaac and Abimelech. Abimelech starts off great. Isaac starts it. And we hope the, the, the son of Abraham, the main character of this Bible story, would be a good example for us. But at the beginning, he's not. He lies to the man. He lies about his wife uh, to save his own neck. And, and we talked about that when we talked about Abraham doing and we don't know if Abimelech gets his men to take down these wells and to fill them up. But can you imagine the hurt feeling of that? I mean, some of you guys have still dug wells. Right? Or you know people who have dug wells in this country proper. And think about how hard it would have been back in that day without mechanic, mechanized tools and equipment. Abraham had several wells dug, and just out of spite, they covered them up. They filled them with dirt and rock all the way up to the top. So you've got to do all that work again to get your daddy's wells back and be able to use it. Just because they were jealous. They were spiteful that you had some success. Maybe they were angry because you had lied to their king. We don't know exactly why, except they were envious of him. We don't know if there was more to it, but that's enough. Envy makes plenty of people do mean-spirited things. This is why one of the Ten Commandments is don't covet. it. Because God knew it was going to get to the heart of a lot of issues. But they were envious, they were covetous, and they persecuted Isaac. Not for religious beliefs or being different, but just because he was successful. And then they came and they argued over the wells that Isaac's people dug up. They came like, Joe here is still covered in the dirt from digging that well. You can't tell me that's not my well. We just dug it. They said, no, no, it's ours. It's been here forever. Yeah. And so Isaac said, think, well, who's the court going to believe? Me, the stranger who just lied to the king, or local guy who's been here the whole time and they're probably fishing buddies. Okay, I will leave another one. And we see how it cycles, because then he moves on, digs another one. They come after him, or another group comes after him and does the same sort of thing time and time again. And he finally gets peace. He finally gets enough open space to, to rest with a new well, he's got water, he can take care of his herds and his people. And here comes the king and his advisor and the commander of his armies. And so Isaac's like, I don't see no soldiers with you, but this ain't good. But I want us to look at what Isaac did, not the lie part, that's not a good example, but in response to all these challenges. He could have rallied up his men and fought against the Philistines. Now, if you remember back in the days of Abraham, Isaac's dad, Abraham's nephew Lot was taken captive by a group of five, four kings who fought against Sodom and Gomorrah, where Lot was living. And so Abraham rallied up his own troops, his own servants, he armed them, and went after them, defeated these kings and their army and freed all these men. Now, Isaac seems to be more and more wealthy. He's gaining more and more compared to his father Abraham. God's blessing him. He's got a lot of servants. He can probably take military action. He can probably stand up for himself and say, these are my wells. You've got to get past my men before you can take that order. This well was dug by my father. It's passed down in the family line. But he did. 
He didn't stand up for his rights. He didn't take them to court, which probably would have failed anyway. He didn't get militant and physically violent or defensive. Instead, he moves on. He tries again somewhere else. And so when we find ourselves in this kind of cycle of conflict with somebody else, whether it's family, coworker, neighbor, a friend, what they call frenemies, your friend enemy, the one you like to mess with the most, we basically have two options. We can escalate it and continue or we can stop the cycle by not feeding into the cycle. We can decide to break it. Isaac decided to break this fledgling cycle before it got worse. Now I know this makes him look like a doormat to us, right? Someone comes into your property and says, hey, now this part of your, your property line, that's not yours, really, that's mine. Remember, this guy was a stranger in a strange land. Moses will say that about himself, but it's true for Isaac too. He's not local and he doesn't actually own any of the land yet. The only part that they own is the cave where Abraham and Sarah were buried. But instead of disputing it, instead of fighting over it, because they're not being threatened with immediate physical violence, this isn't life or death, even though water is extraordinarily important. It wasn't that bad. They, they were able to move on and find more. What he does is he decides not to fight it and to move on and find other water. And we got to ask ourselves, how is he so sure that he's going to be able to find another well? I mean, this is the Middle East. You know, the, the Jordan Valley and the Promised Land is, is more fruitful than most of the Middle East, but still, this is the Middle East. But he trusted the Lord to lead him to where he needed to be. He trusted the Lord to provide for him. And the Lord did. One well, two wells, third well, then at the end, the fourth well. And Beersheba, by the way, is a prominent location that we're going to hear more and more as we read through the Bible. Isaac stopped the cycle by instead of retaliating, he sought a peaceful solution. And I said, this makes us think he might be a doormat, but he wasn't. Notice the king and his advisor and his general come to him and is like, you're blessed. You are blessed by the Lord. You have a huge camp here. You are humongous. Let's make a peace treaty. They may not have acted like the best neighbors, but they did respect. And they realized that this guy could have been a military threat. And so then like said, Maybe honestly, maybe underhanded. We're not sure how much he had to do with his people making problems with the wells. But he said, I sent you away in peace because of just a practical need. You were too much for my area to handle. And when you lied to me, I didn't retaliate. I've been good to you. I promise you're going to be good to me. And so the opportunity for peace came because he didn't escalate or continue the cycle. And the opportunity for peace came, he took it. He never looked like a doormat. Christ doesn't call us to be a doormat or uh, a wuss, you might want to call him, or a supreme pacifist. Our tendency may have been, eye for an eye, Isaac. They plugged up your wells, you go find their wells. Take it from them, or stop them up. They even quote scripture, right? The good book says, eye for an eye. Well, I, I've taught you guys before, have you remembered that the law part of the Old Testament, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, is not just one type of law. There's moral law, like the Ten Commandments. Don't kill. Worship God, only God. There's religious ritual law, like the cleanliness law, how to come into God's presence. Jesus takes care of that. We don't have to go through a ritual to become clean. We have to have our sins forgiven by Jesus. 
his blood makes us clean to come into God's presence. And there was national law for the nation to set up when they became an established governing body in Israel. And so he established laws like not moving people's property line, how to punish a thief, how to punish a murderer. Eye for an eye is a law for the judges to give reasonable punishment that fit the crime. It's not personal vengeance. Law eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth is not for us to take upon ourselves. It wasn't for Israel to take upon themselves as individuals. It was the justice system for the country. And so eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, does not contradict forgive your enemies. Love those who, uh, who hurt you, who persecute you. Pray for those who persecute you. Thousands of years before Jesus would say, as for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. Matthew 5, 40. Or Paul will say in Romans, if possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. Romans 12, 18. Or another one that was too good to leave out, but I found it after I sent Faye the outline. Romans 12, 20. Do not repay evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. The New Testament will teach us these things. Isaac in the Old Testament was living them out. Not perfectly, but pretty well. He broke the cycle. He said, you know, take that well. It's a well. God will provide me the water I need. We'll move on. Instead of making this a fight, instead of making this military action, instead of making enemies with all my neighbors. So what does this look like? How, how do we do that? Where do we draw the line? Because we do have personal property here. Isaac did. We do have, uh, not land. We do have a, a right and a need to defend ourselves and our family. That's not against scripture. He didn't let his people be you know, attacked, be victimized. But living in peace and submitting to our neighbor when it's under the law of God does not mean we change what we believe or how we live to follow them. It is more peaceful to agree with everybody as much as you can. But there are things we can't agree with. There are lots of things in this society we can't agree with, we can't go along with. But living with peace does not mean we renege on what the Lord says or we don't proclaim all of what the Bible says. We stand in truth that we must live in peace with God first and foremost. But it does mean we trust God even when people are hindering us, obstacles to us, hurting us, making things more difficult for us. We trust that the Lord will bring us through and provide what we need even if those folks making it hard to get what we need. And I think that trust is the core because it removes fear of what they're going to do. And it removes jealousy and envy like the Philistines had to Isaac that God's going to provide. And so having our minds transformed, as I prayed earlier, having our hearts in line with God is what it looks like. It is, as Jesus said, and as, as very contrary to our own nature, it does sometimes mean we accept losses without fighting back. And it most definitely is not a vengeance or retaliation. Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. And so if your thoughts and if your hearts are dwelling on that person that Oh, gets your fur up and, and makes you tense and makes you want to just snipe right back at it. That's something you need to take up with the Lord and ask Him to change your heart and renew and change your mind. 
And yes, also, pray for that person. You can't control that person. And if they want to keep on taking those stabs at you, chipping away at your peace. But if your peace is rooted in Christ, you'll have that deep, flowing ocean. That fountain that will come up. And it will be beyond understanding like the Bible talks about. Peace beyond understanding. Because it comes from God. The only way we can love our enemies like Isaac showed this love of peace and love of them above his own self-interest is if Christ is ruling our hearts and our lives. Because like I said, this is not natural, is it? So for maybe people who are unhealthy in their mentality and they do make themselves doing that, that's not healthy. But a healthy human mind does not react this way. Only a sanctified, changed in the core, renewed, transformed mind by the Holy Spirit through the blood of Christ can react this way. And so if you need to come and pray for those people you know who are in these cycles, and maybe it's family members, or another family you know, and brother and sister, or brother and brother, sister and sister, they're not getting along. No one can remember how it started. And one of them was three, she caught the other one with a bad name. Went downhill from there, 50 years later. Maybe you want to come and pray for people to find peace. Come and pray for them when we sing. Maybe you want to come and ask God to help you be at peace with someone that you're having a hard time forgiving and submitting to. Come and pray because he's the only way you can do it. Or maybe you need to be in that blessed life in the first place. Maybe you're thinking, preacher, I, this is not in my nature at all. But I want to live in peace. First of all, you've got to have peace with God. Jesus made that happen. And then you make him Lord, he starts changing your life so you can be more at peace with other people too. So if you need to get right with God, pray about help getting right with others, or pray for others. While everyone else is singing hymn number 482, All to Thee, please come and take use of the altar in prayer. If you want to come become a Christian, tell me. I'll show you how you can do it. Or join this church. We'd love to have you. Whatever is your need, please come as they sing 482.